This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest is an author who hates controversy and arguments, yet God has called him to be a Christian apologist. His most recent books relate to how our culture is moving away from a biblical worldview on sex and relationships. Today, my guest is Sam Alberry, who's joining me from Nashville. I came out of a calling that goes back to uh, Sam Alberry's 18th birthday. This one is called, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? Some of the others are just, the controversial titles are, are all there. Is God anti-gay? Why Bother with Church? Seven Myths About Singleness? You've been a very productive author, Sam. Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to get to write about these things, isn't it? So um, I'm glad for that opportunity. I'm simply trying to share the things I think God has been laying on my heart to speak about. Well, this goes back to uh, a real awakening you had at, at 18 years old. You really weren't living for Christ. Uh, you you didn't, didn't have a relationship with Christ, but you ran into some people who, uh, who encouraged you to be introduced to him. Tell me about that story. Yeah, I was just uh, being a teenager and minding my own business, really. Um, <laughs> I, I, I had neither particularly positive nor negative thoughts about, about Christ. Um, didn't really know who he was, but had some good Christian friends. They invited me to their, their church's youth ministry. And the very first time I heard a presentation of, of the gospel, I realized I'd never heard this before. And it was so much different to what I'd imagined Christianity to be about. I'd always sort of imagined Christianity was about God congratulating good people uh, and began to realize immediately that it was the more difficult and more compelling mu uh, message that, that actually God has come to find lost people and realized immediately that Jesus was less easy and more attractive than I'd ever realized he was and that I was one of the lost people he'd come to find. So it was it was all very quick. This, I, I became a Christian within about probably two or three weeks of first wow. hearing the gospel. Well, it, it, you, I mean, you lived in the UK at the time. You lived in England. And that's, that's a, a nation that used to send more missionaries than we can imagine all over the world. And here you are raised in that country and you don't really know anything about Christianity. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, I knew some of the ethics. Mm -hmm. um, we'd been taught at, at high school, we'd been taught some of the, the sort of moral teachings of Jesus, but it was always within a, an assumed framework of, you know, Jesus is a moral teacher and there are traditions in our country associated with his moral teaching. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a gospel-less form of Christianity. And yeah, it was a cultural form of Christianity. It was it was taught as a form of, of social cohesion. It was a, this is how to be good little boys and girls, um, you know, follow the moral teachings of Jesus. There was nothing of grace. There was nothing of forgiveness. So we, we were given some of the, the ethical outworkings of the gospel without the gospel itself. Well, at, at that age, I mean, you were almost 18 years old. Uh, what struck you the most when you thought, okay, I'm 18 years old and I've never heard this before. What struck you the most that finally, maybe on your 18th birthday, I think, that you made that decision to receive Christ when the youth pastor said, what are you going to do with all this information? What well, was that was it. <clears throat> so, so the thing that struck me the very first time I heard the gospel was it suddenly hit me that if, <clears throat> if there was a God who was there who had made me, I didn't know him. And I sensed that was probably on me. <laughs> rather than being on him and that therefore I needed to be found by him and then when I heard of the coming of Christ and his death his resurrection and that youth pastor said so what do you what do you think about what Jesus has done for you that was the point where I realized if Jesus has died for me and risen again and I believe he has then that has to be everything in life that can't just be be a nice add-on on the side I you know I've got to give everything to him or nothing to him. There's no halfway measures. Well, and so I just remember thinking, you know, if, if this is what he's done for me, I can trust him with my entire life. Was there any in, internal struggle or any, any kind of, a, of an argument that maybe this isn't true? But how did it strike you as this is true? This is true. This is every time you heard <laughs> part of the gospel, it, it just struck in your spirit that this is true. It, that's exactly what happened. It, it just rang true. And in, 
the spirit within me just awakened me to the truth of it. I I suspect I wasn't clever enough to have lots of big intellectual questions and <laughs> objections. Um, I've actually done more of the wrestling since becoming a mm-hmm. Christian than before becoming a Christian. That's when I've really started to, you know, wrestle with some of the big questions of evidence and, and all the rest of it. But at the time, I think it was partly because the 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 chief evidence for the truth of Christianity was the state of my own heart. And I felt like Christ was exposing and laying bare the kind of person I was. And if that was true, my only hope was if was, you know, if Jesus is the kind of person he says he is. Mm-hmm. So I knew in, in my I, I was convicted of sin. I didn't have the terminology in the categories at the time, but I knew I was estranged from God. I knew that was on me and he had come graciously in Christ to seek me. And so if that was the way my heart was, there was nothing else that could possibly help other than the very one who diagnosed that in the first place. You've become a, a Christian apologist, uh, uh, working in areas where you take it to, to students and to, and to people who would argue with you otherwise, but you're bringing the evidence that demands a verdict. I, I grew up with a deep fear of public speaking, and I've always hated conflict. So the fact that the Lord has me speaking publicly on contentious issues um, <laughs> proves he has a sense of humor. And um, it's, yeah, the, the, the calling on my life is, is not one I would have come up with. This is not what I would have written in my own script. What was that like when, I mean, because your fear of public speaking and you've got this youth pastor and you've got a pastor now still in your teen years, maybe your early 20s, and he says, uh, I want you to come and do an interview with me. I want you to, I want you to speak out on what's happened in your life. Uh, what's that prayer like before you, before you speak publicly the first time? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. So this was probably six months into my, my Christian discipleship. He asked me to, to do this interview at church. And I knew two things immediately. I knew I didn't want to do that. But I also knew that I should say yes to my pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said yes to my pastor and then spent the next few weeks, you know, in increasing levels of anxiety about having to do that interview. And really was just, you know, obviously praying in preparation for it. The moment it started, it was okay. Mm-hmm. It was all the anticipation that was so difficult. But once we were actually in the interview and, and talking, I kind of thought, oh, this is okay. I'm just I'm just answering his questions about, about my faith. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and after the service, you know, once everyone else had started to, to sort of leave the building, he came up to me and, and just said to me, you're going to be a preacher. Wow. And that thought had never entered my mind before then. And the moment he said that, I just, again, I knew it was true. Well, God began to stretch you a little bit, though, too, as you got into the pastor in a local church and uh, calling you to speak on issues that were contentious, that uh, in this culture are, are very polarizing for people. Tell me about that, because that's not an area, I mean, you're, you're a Christian apologist, you're a pastor, you're a preacher. And he's saying, no, there's a, there's a focus here that you can speak to that nobody else can speak to. As the issue of, of human sexuality started to really shape Western culture in the you know early 2010s, and, and we saw this sudden sea change in public opinion about same-sex marriage and same-sex relationships, I really felt the Lord laying on my heart, this is an area where you can strengthen the church perhaps in a way that's different to, to how other people can. And so my entering into the fray of speaking about those issues really has been an outworking of that desire to try to, to strengthen and, and bless the church in some way. And I felt the Lord sort of saying to me that my own story and my own journey would give me opportunities that perhaps other pastors wouldn't have to speak to some of these issues from the inside of those issues. And that's Again, it was the last thing I would have chosen for myself. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but as I sensed the Lord leading him in, in that direction, it, it just became something that I felt he was putting on my heart to do. I, I felt compelled to do it. Well, right at that, at that time, uh, you, just, you were writing an article on, on uh, I think it was uh, Mark 10, and mm-hmm. the, the hundredfold return that Christ promises us. How does that work into what you, people think you gave up to become a Christian? How does that work into that? 
Yeah, so I was, I'd been at this church but at this point for several years. I felt like they knew me pretty well. I knew them pretty well. And lots of pastoral issues would come up to do with relationships and uh, unbiblical forms of marriage and all those kinds of things. And it occurred to me that as someone who, who who's wrestled with same-sex attraction in my own life and as a consequence was was finding contentment as in singleness and not pursuing not pursuing marriage it occurred to me that a lot of these pastoral situations would be easier if if the church knew something of my own story and i'd had a number of pastoral situations where someone was for example dating a, a non-christian and preparing for marriage and I'd, I'd have to have difficult questions about why I didn't think that was appropriate and the response I always got was well you don't know what it's like and I kind of wanted to say oh no I, I do actually I know what it's like to have feelings for someone the bible says you can't marry and so I, I wanted to frame that not in a woe is me way but in, in in the light of that promise in Mark 10 that actually we never we never leave behind more for Christ than we receive from him, even in this life. And so while I had said no to pursuing romantic sexual relationships and, and marriage and that kind of thing, I didn't feel hard done by. I didn't feel as if I'd had a bad deal. Um, so I wanted to show people that actually Christ had given me a kind of a real treasure of community and fellowship and family within the body of Christ. And therefore, I wasn't ultimately missing out. And so I use Mark 10 really to frame my own story of wrestling with same-sex attraction, but finding Jesus to be both good and sufficient um, in all my needs in life. Yeah, because the, one of the things people say that you're giving up or the church is requiring you to give up is, is that intimacy with, with a, a soulmate, one other person who really understands you, uh, Christ made us to be a one flesh relationship and if there's a same sex attraction. Why can't that be a man and uh, that you've given up all of that? Is it a fair exchange? That's the big question. And that, that's why I felt compelled to speak into this issue from my own testimony. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to say to people that actually the words of Jesus for people in my situation are good words. They're not easy words. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're painful words. But just as the the surgeon's knife can be painful, actually it's it's helping you and healing you rather than, you know, harming you. So yes, there are some uncomfortable teachings of Jesus. He he makes it very clear in in places like Matthew 19 that that marriage is between a man and a woman. That that one flesh union can only exist between a, a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage and that there is there's a big gospel reason for that which is that one flesh union is a picture of the one spirit union we as believers have with christ himself and points forward to the the great wedding day between jesus and his bride the church and so the very shape of the gospel itself makes sense of the, the sexual ethics we see in the scriptures that the understanding of marriage that we have in the scriptures. So I was wanting people to see that, that actually there is a rationale. It's not an arbitrary set of do's and don'ts here. And that, you know, yes, that there, there isn't the one soulmate spouse that I'm going to be able to um, enjoy that level of intimacy within this life. But nonetheless, there it's still possible to have healthy biblical forms of, of deep relationship and intimacy as Christians, through friendship, through the family of the church, um, and through all of those things. And actually, you know, the, the one flesh union I do have is with the body of Christ. Um, and so I don't experience all that a, a married believer would experience, but I, that doesn't mean I don't get anything. Right. Um, and one of the ways I often think about it is there may be a depth of intimacy that I don't experience by not being married. But singleness affords me the opportunity of experiencing a breadth of intimacy that I might not be able to experience if I was married, being able to have a, a range of, of deep friendships. So I found it to be such a blessing to be single from that point of view. Yeah, let's, let's get back to what the, the, our culture and the media would have us believe about the church. I mean, 
as far as they're concerned, that the church and God are somehow against sex, and that sex is the, is the, the root of all, all kinds of evil, and that uh, it really is that the church preaches that sex is coming from Satan, and uh, your desires are coming from it, that they've really got us convoluted in, in, in where sex came from and whose idea it was. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and sadly, there have been some Christians who've kind of fed into that impression mm -hmm. over the years. But, you know, you, you, you don't have to get further than page two in the Bible to realize that that, that sex was God's idea. Uh, we, we didn't discover it behind his back. And nor was it something he begrudgingly gave us when he discovered that we had all these terrible appetites and needed something to kind of do with those appetites. Um, God invented sex to be a blessing within the appropriate context. Um, and so the Bible is actually pro-sex. And the very reason that there are, are prohibitions in the Bible about certain forms of sexual practices is for the very reason sex is so precious in its in its proper context. So the, the Bible is often more positive about sex than than people realize. And you, you just need to read a book like The Song of Songs to realize how unembarrassed the Bible is to speak to some of these issues. In a moment, I want to discuss with Sam how our culture is moving from seeing the biblical view of sex as old fashioned to now being viewed as dangerous. We've got more in a moment. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your $20, $50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. Why does God care who, we, who I sleep with? Uh, how important sex is to, to our relationship with God. And uh, a great book, it's a great read as well, but uh, lay out some of the, some of the things in, in, in some of these chapters about why it is so important to God and why does, why does He care who I sleep with? If it's love, it's love. Absolutely, and, and this is the reason for the book is that's probably the, the single most common question I get asked when I'm speaking on university campuses mm -hmm. evangelistically that's the big question why, why does God bothered about this surely with climate change or injustice he's got bigger <laughs> things, to, things to, to worry about. about why why bother with what we're doing in our bedrooms mm -hmm. and the, the short answer is he God cares about who we sleep with because he cares about the people doing the sleeping he cares about us and this is an area of life that, that is not insignificant to God. Right. And why should it be when it's not insignificant to us? The fact that we get so bothered by that question is an indication that we think who we sleep with is something that should be off limits to God because it matters so much to us. So what I, one of the things I've, I've tried to do in the book is, is tease out, especially what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says that, you know, you've heard, you shall not commit adultery, but I say any man who looks lustfully at a woman commits adultery in his heart. And trying to show that that challenges every single one of us. 
Sure. Uh, Jesus is trying to show there's something in the hearts of each one of us that instinctively turns other people into a sexual commodity. But by the same token, as in those very same words of Jesus, he, he shows us that of the person being looked at, that they have a sexual dignity that matters so much to him that it can't be violated even in the privacy of someone else's mind. And so we find from the lips of Jesus the most challenging teaching on human sexuality that I think there is, but also the most dignifying teaching on human sexuality that there is. And it makes sense, I think, of this, this strange, awkward cultural position that Western civilization is in, where we, on the one hand we're trying to say sex is just physical, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything, it's just animalistic, don't get so prudish, whilst on the other hand saying... If you don't affirm my sexual identity, you are rejecting who I am and I can't be fulfilled as a human being without my sexual identity. Um, those contradictory stances ultimately show us why we, we need the perspective of Scripture and all of these things. Well, it's, uh, in, in, in today's culture, it's, uh, we are cancelled in today's culture if we decide that uh, there's only two genders that if we decide mm -hmm. that you, you, you can't identify yourself by sexual preference or by sex, you identify yourself by who God says you are. And uh, yeah. all of a sudden we're in this, in this battle with, with modern culture about our identity. Very much so. I think so. And, and one of the challenges we find ourselves in now is in earlier generations, we might have been seen as old-fashioned or prudish. Mm -hmm. um, now we're not just seen as old-fashioned and prudish, we're seen as dangerous. And the, the, the Christian view on human sexuality is seen as, as harmful. And that, that's a cultural space we've not really had to occupy before in, in our living memory. So it's hard, rather than being, you know, a generation or so ago, someone might have said, I don't want to become a Christian because you guys are too moral. Now someone is more likely to say, hey, I don't want to become a Christian because you guys are too evil in what you believe. Mm-hmm. That gives us the challenge of finding winsome and compelling ways to articulate the Christian view of human sexuality. That, that's what I'm trying to do in that book is it's not just a list of negatives. There's actually a positive vision of human sexuality that, that Christ is inviting us into. And that's what I'm trying to help people to see. Well, I've, I've had the argument people say, well, well, sex is such a strong, powerful expression of, of a relationship with somebody that why would God restrict it to marriage? And the other is that if sex is just hooking up and it's not, there's no, no consequence to it if it's two con consenting adults. So they got these two various things that why, yeah. either one is, why would God care about it? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to, to borrow an analogy that others have used over the years, you know, why, why should fire be restricted to the fireplace in your home? Mm -hmm. It's such a, a wonderfully warming, pleasant experience. Why simply restrict it to that? And I love that analogy. I don't know who first came up with it, but it shows that in the right context, fire is life-giving. And in the wrong context, you know, it burns the whole thing down. It's, it's so destructive and uncontrollable. And it's precisely because sex is so powerful that we need to understand the context in which that power can be life-giving, indeed life-creating, and a blessing to us rather than having it in a context where actually that, that very power is going to cause untold damage and, and very deep pain to all of us. You, you have an example in here of, of uh, I think it might have been in a, I don't know, it was in a trial or what, we're, what what's, what's the value of a little girl worth? I mean, what, what, is, what is the value? What, mm. what, what, are, what are we stealing from somebody when, when we sexualize them? What are we stealing from them? Exactly. That's that's a line, a very powerful line that Rachel Den Hollander raises. And in fact, she's written a book with that that question as a title. How much is a girl worth? Um, she was testifying at the Larry Nasser case where he was convicted of, of horrific sexual abuse. And this is so significant that, that the Me Too movement has has sought to shine a light on the prevalence and the damage caused by sexual abuse. And again, the very, the very fact it is doing so proves that the whole it's just physical and doesn't innately mean something line is, is so false. The very fact that sexual abuse causes not just 
physical harm, but really deep psychological harm is precisely because in the right context, sex is, is designed to, to do something psychologically good in our lives. It isn't just physical. Well, you take, uh, you, you speak before a lot of, a lot of college age students, a lot of college age people. And uh, what do you see now? I mean, what's the response you're getting back from them with this message? Because their worldview is, is so convoluted these days compared to what it used to be when you were getting out of high school or college. What's the response yeah. you're getting back from them? And, and what do you see their worldview? Is it changing again or is it, do we have any hope? <laughs> uh, there's always hope. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, the cultural shifts that have taken place have many of us scratching our heads and trying to keep up and figure out how on earth people have got to thinking what they're thinking now. Um, there are lots of good resources that can help us better understand those shifts. None of it catches God off guard and none of it robs the gospel of any of its power. We, we need to be more thoughtful perhaps about how we articulate the gospel into such a context, particularly when we're talking about sexual identity and sexual ethics. But I have found there is so much interest and discussion. Um, I try and make it clear when I speak on these topics that, you know, Jesus puts all of us in the same boat here. He's not singling one group out for, for kind of, you know, particular condemnation. Mm -hmm. All of us are, are broken and fallen when it comes to human sexuality. All of us need grace and forgiveness. So I think when people don't feel that they are specifically being got at, over and above other people, mm -hmm. that they're more willing to listen. Um, and when I try to talk about what the Bible says about intimacy and identity, I find a lot of people really listen into that. There's, there's biblical wisdom that checks out. So I think rather than it being a whole issue that we, we might want to avoid evangelistically, actually, I think these very issues are a really good on-ramp to talking about the gospel. And there's a harvest out there. There's a harvest I'm, out there. I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I agree with you there. But this book, this one in particular, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? Uh, Sam Alberry, and uh, you can get it several different places, but it's published by the good, uh, go to good book, uh, the goodbook.com.co.uk. Where else can they get the book, Sam? Um, I think it's in all the usual places mm -hmm. you find books, yep. um, Amazon and so forth, and hopefully some a few remaining Christian bookstores as well. So um, it should be easy to get your hands on. It can seem daunting in our culture that the Christian worldview is difficult to defend. That's one of our hopes of Viewpoint, to bring biblical worldviews from qualified sources who not only have knowledge, but life experience defending their faith. If you like what you've seen, please share it with others. We'd also like to ask you to support us with a financial gift. As you can imagine, we don't have sponsors on a show dealing with these subjects. So we rely on your generosity. Thanks for watching. You can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast. <laughs>